we on Boss Talk 101. Yeah, we gon' talk, we gon' have fun. We be on fire, we be lit lit. It's a unique hustle, big, big, big shit. Big shit, big shit, big shit. It's a unique hustle, nigga, big shit. Big shit, big shit, big shit. Name another podcast like this. Check it, check it, check it. It's a unique hustle. It's your boy ECO, and I'm here with the lovely, amazing, outstanding. I can keep going. No, that's all right. Mr. Makers in the building. What's going on? <laughs> Nothing. You know my dad walk on? Man, I got a guy here today, y'all. He don't need no introduction. Uh, the guy's a hip-hop head. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Uh, he snuck in the game. I don't know how the <laughs> hell he snuck in with all white on. He snuck I in know. the game, man. DJ Burn One's in the building. Hey. Yeah, we on Boss Town. <laughs> I love hey, you. Hey, the hey, intro. Wait to say I'm on boss side. Yeah, we on boss side. <laughs> yeah, we on boss side. I love the game, though. You looking like you a doctor or yeah, doctor? Yeah, you probably got me. I'm like, this a damn doctor. Hey, I don't know what to do with this nigga. What? That's hey, <laughs> hey, like yeah. he works in a lab, lab had, music lab. Facts. Well, I thought about the, you know, the Dr. Dre uh, and Eminem video uh-huh, when I seen him. <laughs> when uh, when yeah. they was billing 50 or something, you know? <laughs> right, exactly. In the lab. That's right. All right, and that's kind of what it's inspired by. Really? You know? well, really? Well, really, it's inspired by Abbey Road. So the studio that uh, the Beatles used to record at in okay. London, mm-hmm. um, the engineers used to wear lab coats. Wow. That's why we say that's we're in the lab, cool. in right. the studio. You know, right. we're still in yeah. the laboratory. We're that's conducting awesome. experiments. You know wow. what I'm saying? So now I'm just like embodying it. Hey. You know? Yeah. And it puts me in a different mindset when I walk in the studio too, because mm-hmm. now I'm not worried about being perfect. Mm-hmm. Now I realize it's like if you look at any inventor, they failed more than they succeeded. That's correct. But it's like we're stuck in this thing where we always have to succeed when we walk in. So it's like it just puts me in a mind of I could just try anything. Mm-hmm. I'm just here to experiment these experiments, and then whatever we come out with, we come out. It with. puts you at wow. ease because you won't have so much pressure on your shoulders because that's a lot of pressure to come in to just to succeed. You know what I mean? Right. And it's like you know artists want you to kind of shepherd them to success. So mm-hmm. it's like. You step in and it's like, make me successful. And it's like, all right, <laughs> you got to meet me here. <laughs> you know, you got to meet me here. Right. We got to come. But, but yeah, you're right. It like alleviates part of that off me. Yeah. So tell me about DJ Burn One before you were DJ Burn One growing up as a kid. Um, were you originally from Atlanta? Yep. Yep. Uh, born in downtown Hapeville. Okay. So it's like a little a little small city at the very bottom of Atlanta. <laughs> um, and it's really like a little country town just attached to the bottom of Atlanta. Really? Because if you went to it, you know, you'd feel like, wow, it's like it's kind of changed over the years but back when i grew up it was like a very small like little country town at the bottom of the city mm-hmm. um and it was right off of cleveland avenue so okay. i'm like right in the middle of everything and Ready so yeah so i played baseball and mm-hmm. just normal kid stuff and then one day i remember i was like maybe eight and i went to uh my mom's car it was like in, in between games i was like can i go relax in the car and she said yeah and then i remember i saw on the ground a tape of kilo ali's get this party started mm-hmm. it had nasty dancer hey. and all this stuff on there <laughs> yeah i'm like eight you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So like, I pop it in, and my mind is just blown. I'm like, "Yo, what is? <laughs> what it? am I hearing?" You know, so what he was talking about before even Nasty Dancer. He was talking about like racism. He had yeah. another song at the the top of it that was talking about racism and all this stuff. And it's like it opened me up to so much. And yeah. she never played it when you were around. No, it wasn't hers. Oh, it wasn't hers. Somebody had dropped it out of their car, and it was oh. just sitting beside our car. So it was like right in the middle on the ground. Oh. And so I picked it up and put it into our car. So somebody lost their kilo tape. You hey. know? <laughs> so what did your but mom say hip-hop, when you she know? came back and heard you? Listen listening to it uh you know i think i hit it for a long time you know when you're young you're like oh i ain't supposed to be hearing this and i found like a red fox comedy album Woo. and i was like oh i'm not supposed to be playing these around my parents i had that dolomite wow there you go. It, uh, way down, down in the jungle deep you know and i was like damn he curse a lot. <laughs> yeah. So you knew you weren't supposed to play the around your parents, you know. <laughs> that's but funny. that's what got me into hip hop. And then hearing all this stuff around when I was growing up, I was like, what is this? And it always just seemed like a different way to get information. And mm-hmm. it re- always represented more to, than just music to me. You yeah. know, I see people get into it now and I wonder, is it because it's so easy that people want to do it? Or is it mm-hmm. something that's just like a part of them and who yeah. they are and how they speak and, and just everything about them? To me, hip hop is like a lifestyle. And, yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's deeper than just sounds. I always believe that, well, growing up, I used to always feel like you have to have, have it in you, like genetically, um, to come up and do it. Because I always feel like if you can't just sing whenever you're young, you, you just can't sing. But as I got older, I realized that really, everybody can sing, it's just that you have to take the time to practice and to train your voice to sing. Because right. everybody have different sounds, you just have to perfect the sound that you have to make it sound really good. 
Absolutely. To the air. Yeah, it's time invested. Right. It's time invested and then finding th- certain things to be curious about. I think once you figure out how to unlock creativity in one way, mm-hmm. whether it be shooting videos or doing anything creatively, making clothes or anything, mm-hmm. you can translate that. You're like, oh, you have exactly. like a framework for work now. You're like, okay, find a thing to do, get obsessed with it, learn about it, try it, fail, try it, fail. Exactly. All right, now I got a thing and I can do it. You're like, I can do that with anything. Mm-hmm. You know, you really realize it's just time invested at that point. And you were raised with your mom and dad? Yeah, yeah. How were brothers, sisters? Uh, yeah, I had a brother and a sister, yep. Had a brother? No, I have. Okay, yeah, I was just have, checking. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, but in the community that you were raised in, was that a norm to have, like, all your friends, did they have their parents together in the same household, or? Not all of them. Not all of them. Like I said, I live, like, in this very kind of, yeah. like, almost secluded part of uh, South Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it was, like, half and half, almost, half and like, half. in my way. And, and luckily, I was around... Uh, team sports mm-hmm. and so I think that kept me more around other families that were together I think something about team sports is mm-hmm. usually it's like the parents are together a lot of time you know what I'm saying in that mm-hmm. in that case um, and so I think I, I was around a lot of other parents like that but we still spent like all our summer just at the rec camp okay, you know like we weren't cool. able to just hang out in the street right. like our parents were like no you're going to the rec camp yeah. and so we just listen to music and play video games and stuff there and wow. that community was it mainly predominantly white black Hispanic or black and Hispanic, black and Hispanic. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. okay. Yeah. He, he stood out like a sword. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I fit in. I yeah, fit in. Yeah. I didn't stand out, and so I went to like the South Side. I, I went to high school in the you suburbs. To, what happened with yeah. that? Was uh, it, everybody was like, "Who's this white kid that talks?" Was you black? nervous? I'm, like, I'm Mexican, first off, and this <laughs> is where people <laughs> talk like where I'm <laughs> from. I never, I didn't even know until somebody said I talked different. And I was like, "What are you talking about?" Right. And then I was like, "Y'all do talk kind of square." You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm like, maybe I do talk a little different. You know, but I didn't realize I was different till then. And then it was so funny, just as quick as they started hating on me, I had T.I. host my first tape when I was in high school. Wow. And those same people immediately jumped on my dick like that yeah, quick. Man. You know, it was like it went from Which we T. hate I? you to being like, you know, T.I. This was right when trap music came out. Oh, right when trap wow. music came out. Really? So he hosted my first tape How like did that two happen, months. Though? I went to school with the girls. Uh, there were a group called Ecstasy and it was two girls mm-hmm. and they went to the school. They were like the grade above me. Mm-hmm. And so I think they had graduated and I was a senior. And I'd asked them one day, I was like, hey, I just saw them around. I was like, hey, do y'all think y'all and T.I. can host my tape? And this was like a month or two, two months before trap music. And they were like, yeah, sure. So he left me some voicemail, like Big Country, Mac Boney, they did. And T.I. left me drops all on my phone when That's I was like 17, 16, 17. Yeah, early. Yeah. It must have blew your 24s. mind when that happened. I got the drops. That's I was like, what? My yeah, yeah, it was on yeah. your cell phone. I had like a little Nokia. You know what I'm saying? So I didn't have as much had. technology in your hand. Right. You just listen to it. You're like, what? Like, let me hold it to the thing and record it real quick, you know? Um, but no, nah, that's, that's really what put me in the game. And then uh, they allowed me to just start coming around C.I. studio. And so was from putting out mixtapes in high school to just hanging around there and like learning, really that's where I cut my teeth and like learned what a track out was, what a full beat stem mm-hmm. was. Cause until then I'd just been, I'd been early on the internet. So I was downloading instrumentals and acapellas and just blending them, doing like mashups. Yeah. But I didn't know a beat could be broken down into just the kick or just the snare, or just mm-hmm. the baseline. I thought it was just one thing. And then I got in the studio, a big country. Wow. I was like, what's that? He's like, that's the stems. It's like, where are the stems? He's like, that red one's a snare. Blue one's a kick, and I was like, I don't even know what those are, <laughs> you know. And I'd, I'd been so. Uh, what the hell is Big Country at now? Man, I think I saw him on Instagram the other day, but I ain't seen him. I ain't seen him Years. in a minute. I bumped into Mac Boney like a couple months ago. Yeah, he's doing good, but yeah, I ain't seen Country in a minute. They just chilling, like like this was a big move down here, man. Mm-hmm. It was. But see that that first album, you know, the one Tip did, the first one, it was kind of like, ah, uh, talking about uh, I'm serious. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, that first one, then it came a little harder. You know what I'm saying? It, it was people don't realize how this game was. Like it was a different people when it first took you. It meant something to get in the game back then, didn't it? It was Especially a different time. Especially to be time. on a major label. Correct. It, you know? it meant something. It was a different time, bro. But I think I, I know Flip motivated him. You know. <laughs> Everything did. Everything know? did. But Everything the culture did. Was and honestly, different. I think the thing that people don't realize that probably motivated Tip the most was him getting out of his deal to even do trap music. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. like that time in between I'm serious, he pretty much he got out of it. Essentially deal. was gonna get dropped, essentially, you know, probably later would have got dropped, but he went and talked himself to get out of the deal and kept it moving, you know. Mm-hmm. I think that was like the real motivation. Cause I think a lot of times I'll see people they'll lose their deal and then they're gone. 
And it's like, man, the label, this, that. He wasn't taking that. No. You know, I think that's what artists today should really learn from. Learn it's like, from he wasn't sure. taking that. He wasn't sitting down. It's like, y'all aren't interested? Cool. Mm -hmm. Let me go find somebody who is. Y'all exactly. don't get it. Don't take no for an answer. Yeah, exactly. Because even I'm serious, we kind of feel like it was kind of, uh, because a lot of the songs weren't made for us. Correct. Mm -hmm. But the songs that were, like, still ain't forgave myself, certain yeah, records, yeah. we're like, man, that's the tip I want. And that's what he brought to he trap brought music. To trap He's me. like, this is what y'all want. And I thought y'all want a commercial tip. Y'all didn't want that, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. But when did you start really taking it serious? Because before, even before, or how did you get into it before that? Because I know that you said at 17, Tip did that for you. But before that, you didn't really say, you jumped in between oh, you signing the tape to <laughs> him doing that. So how did you get into the music? Because when you think about DJ Burn One, I'm thinking about you DJing, DJ, DJ, but then now you're producing. So how did you, how did so all... So the evolution started just for me being a fan when I was a kid. I found that tape and just became like just became in love with hip hop music. And then when I was like maybe 15, 13, 14, 15, mm -hmm. I got on the internet and started doing mixtapes. Mm -hmm. Started releasing mixtapes and I got a job at a CD store called Super Sound, a model okay. pop CD store. Okay. And that was start where I started learning about the game. Like okay. I had to understand when somebody came in and said what's hot, you had to have a reason. You know, it's like I think a lot of people when they're making music, they don't get that. Like, mm -hmm. why are you making music? Like people come in what's hot and I'd have to say this and they'll say why. So mm. it just made me think about music on a deeper level as opposed right. to just, so when I started making music, I wanted to come with like something other than the regular, or just something. I, knew, mm -hmm. I realized I had to have a reason for people to listen to me, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, anyway, so I started just putting out mixtapes in my high school. And so T.I. hosted that first okay, one gotcha. after, I think I dropped like maybe two real ones. And then he, uh, he hosted it. And then from there on, I started doing more tapes. I did Gucci Mane. Were Man. you taking it serious at that time? Oh, I would get off every day after school and drive around 285 and drop CDs off on consignment, talk to the CD store owners, figure out how I can make my product better. This was my whole like 11th and 12th What grade. did your like, parents think about it? Apparently they didn't know. Oh, yeah, apparently. apparently. I didn't know this until I sent my mom one of my interviews the other day and she was like, I didn't know you were driving around. I thought you just went to Greenbrier one time. <laughs> they were so mad I went to Greenbrier because we had a location uh, and that's where T.I.'s uh, Trap Music in-store uh, was in Greenbrier. Yeah. And uh, they got so mad because I went there. I was like, I used to go there like all the time. But they didn't know that, you know? Because uh, uh, I, would, I would get off and all these stores were like in the hood. So you go to like right. Canler Road, you go to Greenbrier, you go to the um, Old National Flea Market, mm -hmm. all these places, but I'm doing music. I'm not there for the extra shit. And right. my dad's already put me on game about just, you know, being aware while you're out and just, I'm never a disrespectful person anyways. I feel like a lot of stuff people bring on themselves, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of shit just happens. And a lot of stuff people just like, you need to know when you move, how to move is, I don't know. Maybe it was just innate to me and, so, and where I grew up. I want to ask you about Dro though before we move into Gucci. Yeah, absolutely. And so Dro was like, I think those two were like my first real big like uh, mm -hmm. tapes that made it outside of Georgia. Yeah. How old were you? Um, maybe eighteen. Oh, still. Maybe really eighteen young. because I found Dro just from being up at Ti Studio after that, and Dro would come through, and I was like, this guy's funny as hell. I thought he was a cartoon character. I was like, this dude <laughs> is so funny, and he didn't really have any music. And I was like, well, let's do a mixtape. He's like, what's that? <laughs> You know, same thing with Gucci. When I told him, let's do a mixtape. He's like, what's that? I'm wow. like, all right, man, these guys in New York are doing these tapes. You know, it's like, because in the South, we had blend tapes. So we had like Jelly and Oomp Camp and uh, Edward J doing blends of like instrumentals over acapellas, which is what I grew up on. But in New York, they were doing like dip set tapes of like artist products, yeah. art, artist projects. And so that's what I was trying to bring down here. I'm like, let's do a, an artist project. And so, so Dro didn't even have were, music. They were further advanced than we were, or they no, were they just they had just been doing mixtapes for so long. I think the mixtape kind of advanced and evolved to where they were like, we can have as artists our own tapes and put out. This is what I pitched to Gucci. I was like, you can put out your own tape and basically release it like an album on your own and not have to deal with the label. That's the way it and was. And go straight to the fans. I think that's what Dip said and mm -hmm. some of those people up there. Fifty Cent. That was really mm -hmm. why I pitched Gucci on was Fifty Cent. I'm like, Fifty Cent's out getting <laughs> show money and he's not dealing with the label. He's like. That's what I want to do. That's what I want to do. Because when I first played it for him, I met him right before he put out So Icy, and he played me So Icy. And I was like, let's do a mixtape. And he was like, I don't know what that is. He's like, but I'm focused on my album, which I appreciate. You know, a lot of yeah. people give you the runaround. Um, but he was like. So you had met, what's the name during that time when he did the So Icy? Uh, Zay Tobin? Yeah. Yeah. I met him the same time. And really how I met Gucci was so random because on the radio, you know, you got to think back then there wasn't all these type of social mm -hmm. medias. Now you could just reach out to somebody. Back then, everybody was so scattered around. Scattered and you had to know somebody to know somebody that knows somebody. somebody. Right, and then you just listen to the radio. <laughs> That's right. Right, that was like Correct. your main source, and so you listen to the radio, and I heard, the, uh, it was a remix called Black Tea. It's yeah. like the response yeah, yeah, to yeah, White Tea. That. Come on, yeah. man. And it was Gucci and like 17 other people yeah, on that yeah. song. It was, you know, it was a whole Never Again Records. And so <laughs> I looked up in the phone book, 
Back you used to get a phone book. People don't even know now. You get a I phone remember book. phone books. Open up the phone book. Never again records. Called it. Gucci answers the phone. No. Out of all the 17 people. Him being the hustler, he answered the phone. He's like, yeah, come up here. I came up there. He immediately took me from that studio to Zaytoven's house. Wow. To his basement. To his basement. He didn't mess with me never again for two more seconds, you know. He's like, we're going over to Zay, my producer's house. And so I go over there. I never heard of Zay. And he plays me so icy. And I was like, wow. And kind of like you're saying, just a natural reaction. I was like, what? You know, because Lil Will is my favorite singer. Like from the Danger family, looking for yeah, Nicki yeah, and all that yeah, stuff. Yeah. And he auto-tuned him. I was like, you auto-tuned Lil Will? Mm -hmm. And this is before auto-tune was even like a trend. Right. This was like maybe right around T-Pain started mm -hmm. doing it. Insane. And so to hear oh. Lil Will auto-tuned on that, I was like, this is terrible. Yeah. That was just my thought, you know? <laughs> but I was like, I liked him and I thought he was funny again, just like Dro. And so I was like, let's do a tape. So, and so he wasn't interested and he didn't hit me up till like a year later till mm -hmm. after Icy blow up. And then it uh, kind of like ran its course and he was kind of in the, in the Kind of like in the public light in Atlanta, kind of looking at like uh, people were looking at him like a one hit wonder almost. Like he came, you had a hit, but we don't really know what else you got. He put out a couple other songs that didn't do good. How was they told me though? Like when you went to the always house cool, always cool. Back and he was he developing his sound the same too. Same as he is today. Same guy. He's never changed, and he's always just kind of like been evolving that sound that he's been working on. Because like even the beats from that first year, a lot of stuff after that sounded pretty much like that, but just like he figured out what it was, you know? But he's always been super cool. Everybody I meet that know him, uh, always, I always try to get him to. I've been, he'll hit me back in the DM, but he don't like, you know, I guess, you know. He don't be doing interviews. He do it with Country Wayne, <laughs> which we got Mike Bless. It's certain what people he doing it with. I'm just trying to figure out how I'm going to get him. He ain't going to be gone long. Now, he'll be on home. Get him. <laughs> but he definitely one that I, I really, uh, I know he's a culture and I know he's a real deal and he's spiritual. So I, right. I like the connection. I know how that sauce go, you definitely. know, with him. So I just, that's why I asked you, like, how was it meeting Zay Tobin when you went over there? He had to be a laid back dude at that time. Super Hell, he cool. was playing in the church D. You yeah. know what I'm saying? <laughs> Bro, even when times got super uh, tense, you know, while we were working on Chicken Talk, there were some times that got tense with other people, not with him. And he was just like very cool and diffused it, you know, like that's very, what very God, chill. That's you know? what God will do, see? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, like he wasn't getting all up in the rah rah. He's like, all right, y'all can go. Yeah, that's everybody, right. y'all can all go, you know? He loved the music. Yeah, right. That's all he's there for. Man, and you the same way. I yeah, can just absolutely. imagine. Yeah. And that's the good part of having people that are balanced out the situation. Lives are being saved in the midst of that you don't even realize it's just how people be like they'll say certain young people come on our show they be like you gotta tell them something like, you don't never say this you gotta in the comments I see them say this but just to be in the presence to, to be in the presence of one that's been married for 20 years don't drink don't smoke says a lot and could be helping to save people from going in a situation just because of the presence oh yeah Am I right? Yeah. yeah. No, the absolutely. presence is so important, and I think people, it's, it happens so seamlessly that you don't even realize it's happening. Yeah. Am I right? No, 1,000%. <laughs> no, you are. You are, man. You know, I've diffused many situations. Exactly. You know, just like, by the presence. Just by the presence and, and the presence of mind as well. That's it. You know, my dad used to always tell me, if you feel like some shit's going to go down, get the fuck out of there. What? Your dad but right. He, <laughs> you know, so I feel like that. Anytime I feel like, hmm, I just go. You know what I'm saying? I just go, I move on. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Or I just, Next you know. day you hear about it, man, two cars, hit this, two guns went off with a bum. I was at the house. <laughs> right. I felt like something was about to happen. So I got back 30 minutes before all that. Good. Right. <laughs> so um, what is the biggest album you have um, worked on? P worked on, produced? produced. Um, I've worked on a lot of stuff. I produced two records on ASAP Rocky's first album. Yes, yeah, so okay. That was that's real dope. Big, that's real mm -hmm. big. Yeah, so we did. But was that the biggest one? Um... You know, I don't know. Well, you know honestly, it's different. like big is big is a, a relative word, right? Because you know, it's like uh, I've been doing a lot of stuff with the Recording Academy. I just did a party with them, their summer yeah. event, uh, a couple weeks ago. But I didn't really care about Grammys before, you know, because people would always tell me when I ever talked about Grammys, they're like, "You did Chicken Talk. Do you know how much that meant, meant to, to the, the streets, to, no, the culture, to the culture, to everything? You know yeah. what I'm saying? Like." Mm -hmm. The Grammy, if you would have, you know, whatever would have won a Grammy for the album that year can't yeah. match up to the no. impact that that had, you that know? helped us. So I feel like probably Chicken Talk would have to be the most impactful. Okay. And to be able to say, I gave him the blueprint on how to do mixtapes. Mm -hmm. And he went on to become like to the mixtape god, essentially. Like him and, <laughs> him and Lil Wayne, you know. When you're dealing like with Gucci, man, that's a whole nother level. That, that dude bad, bro. Like, how is his work ethic? Like, everybody brags about the fact that this dude never left the studio. Is this mm. a true statement? Oh, it is. It is. There's so many times where we have left the strip club at like four, three, four in the morning and then go back to the studio and he just raps for three, four hours. 
when does he three, sleep? Three, four hours. And then, uh, well, he does eventually sleep. But the time yeah. is way off. Yeah, the time is way off. But, but yeah, like he would rap in, and not just like he's writing a rap and then going down. He's freestyling off the top of his head, but not like people do now. There's so many people now is like, I don't write. Yeah, but you punch a million times. They punch you know, like, like don't Don't say that. Well, I got to punch. I got to you know, keep run stopping. Me run me back. You're yeah. like, oh, my God. You hate that, don't you? Oh, I hate it. Because it's like, to me, I, I once was with the artist. I was a um, consultant, artist. I did consulting, and uh, they bought a verse from Bun B. Mm-hmm. He flew in to Birmingham, not even to Atlanta, because the Birmingham flight was cheaper. Flew into Birmingham, came in, wrote his verse, picked up his money in 10 minutes, laid it in 10 minutes, and then left and was back in the Birmingham airport. I'm like, these people done punch. Bun B could have flew into Birmingham. <laughs> That's what I said. Got to Atlanta, drove back to Birmingham, been back to Tennessee by your time you're sitting here trying to punch and get your thoughts wow. together. You know, it's like Jay-Z was formulating his ideas before he went in the booth. Exactly. You know, it wasn't really a Same freestyle. Same thing with Biggie. So it's like, to say I don't write, it wasn't really not writing. He's just kind of like writing it in his head hey, before he goes in there. That's right. But, so I think people got lost when they got in the booth and they're like, well, Jay-Z don't write. No, no, no. No, no, no. Let me get that again. No, 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 no. You know, it's like, no, nah, that's not exactly how it works. So I watch Bun B be very efficient. And then I watch these other people just like, nah, be efficient at all. And I'm trying to tell them, why don't you just take 10 minutes and write? No, it's a vibe. It's not a vibe. It's not wow. a vibe if we're just... You know, it's like the stop and start of everything as opposed to just feeling how fluid it was when he came in, wrote his verse, laid it. We got the whole rest of the session to work mm-hmm. Man, but as you opposed to you trying to figure out but your bars is, and how you want to do it. Bun B is a different yeah, whole beast. Yeah, everybody's different. You, is. You, do, do you don't understand what you keep saying. You keep putting these boys <laughs> in a man's place. Hey. Bun B is he from Texas, man. First of all, let me just shout that out. <laughs> right, he is. <laughs> Bun B is a different type of animal because Bun B started this in a Port Arthur somewhere. And, and, and he was just blessed to be uh, lyrically inclined, and he takes so much. He had to deal with Pimp C, which mm-hmm. is my favorite all time. Yeah. So he had to come with it because Pimp was doing his part, of course, his, his basically beat making and singing and all. And then you got Bun. Bun, like, I got to lace this when I come through. Then he come to the studio with whoever this dude is you talking about. This guy hadn't had to deal with the level <laughs> of what <laughs> Right. He didn't know like, man, I'm going to punch this in. I heard Jay say it. Jay. <laughs> it's not the same. It's not the same. But it's, it's not just, the same. But, but I feel like we should use the bar to be like, this is what we can aspire to be. Like, right. Tupac never punched. No. You know, not saying nobody should ever punch. But when I first started recording, because I heard that, I didn't let nobody punch. You know, it took me a couple people crying in the booth. You I know, imagine. You know, for me to be like, all right, so they're not Tupac, you know? <laughs> but I feel like we should have that bar because as a producer, I always want to come like organized noise level. I want to come Pimp C level. I want to come mm-hmm. DJ Paul and Juicy J yeah, level. Too, but that's like and it's like, level. if I don't hit it, that's cool. But it, like, that's my aspiration. Yeah. It's like, I feel like we should have like a goal of something higher to hit, like a target almost. Even if it's not like we're holding ourselves necessarily to the Bun right, B rap standard. Right. It's like, let's just make use of our time effectively. Who but if you? you're new into this, you know, it takes time before you get to that level. If you've been doing it a while, like Bun B and all of them that you're talking about, man, I guarantee you when they started, they didn't start like that. Oh no, I agree. Hell no. Well, I'm just telling people they'll, they'll spend way less money on studio time <laughs> if you write help. your bars before you get there. You know, and then when you get there, you can figure out your flow and that could be the, you know, you're figuring out your performance aspect of it more so than the bars. And then you're having more fun. Who sure. impressed you when you got off into the lab or into the studio and you seen them work, whether it was KL, whether it was any, uh, you know, anybody that, that stuck out DJ Paul, who was it that you, when you seen them, you was like, man, like it made you feel like this serious. Man, on the, on the rapper level, I'd probably say Dro and Gucci. Oh yeah. Together. Rap- and Dro was dope because he had a, a milk crate full of bars, like just notepads. Mm. And so I'd pull up a beat and he would just flip through the notepads and be like, all right, I got one. And it'll be wow. perfect. It'll be perfect. Like 36 bars of just heat. So if you listen to our first tape, uh, I still got that drill. It's like, just bars. Just bars. He already had them before he you already already had showed them. him the beat. He already had them. He just, I guess he would just be writing in his own time. His no, he, he was, was writing. Right. He had, he, yeah, he had notes, notepads. Yeah, in, in his like own notebooks. time. But it's just, what, it, what he's saying is that the fact that he had something that was so perfect. All he had to do was listen to it, and he's like, okay, I have one for that. He knew so already right. in his he was mind that right. different verses. He already knew. That's dope. He would rap the first couple ones, nah. First couple bars, nah. Okay, this worked. Yeah, this you know? one worked. And that was dope. But uh, as far as producer, uh, DJ Toon. DJ, DJ Toon is okay. just like, I feel like he really is the South Dr. Dre. Like, well, okay. I've heard like that a, often. Yeah, he's just like such a technician. 
Yeah. And like you could tell he's perfected the things that he's done for so long. He's been producing for what, 30, 35, 35 probably more years. years. Um, yeah. But he's just such a technician. The way he's able to get his sounds out, the way he approaches it. Sometimes he'll just play the first two chords. I'm, I, I remember I used to watch him like, what is he doing? Like, dun, dun. And then there'll be nothing on the back half of the beat. And then later on, he'll come back. Dun, 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 dun. I was like, <laughs> how did you even think to leave that space to do something? You know, but his brain is just like. He owned it. Yeah, it's amazing. So you, you're you like, okay, this is why you're like one of the architects of a whole new sound. You know, him and Shotty Red are like the architect of the track I know. sound pretty, pretty much. Him, him and T.I. was, they were cold together. Yeah. God, damn. Yeah, man. Bad boys right there, man. They were really dope. <laughs> so, but you, like I said, you did your thing, man. You are part of our history, man. You are our culture. We love you. You know what I'm saying? That's I the whole it. cold part about it. Once we got you, we got you. You can't, you can't go over there. Now, you did have uh, Yellow Wolf. You did. Mm -hmm. I, I met Yellow Wolf. You see him on the wall. We met my store. Mm -hmm. um, how was it working with him? Yellow Wolf was dope. We actually, um, we did his first tape. Uh, that blew up trunk music and that was real cool because then we went toward Wiz Khalifa right before uh, Cush and Orange Juice came out yeah and so Wiz was kind of like fairly unknown at the time I remember we went on tour with him he's packing out these thousand people venues and we're like how how do all these people know him like we ain't really heard of Wiz down in the south yeah and um, it was just like his charisma he was building like this uh, fan base behind him it was almost like uh, kind of like how Odd Future did Okay. Like Tyler, they kind of like reach out to a certain group of people and it's like those people gravitate to them and now they have these fans like Wiz and Currency kind of got all the stoners, yeah. all the smokers. Yeah. And um, anyways, Cushion and Orange Juice came out while we were on tour. And so that was really cool seeing him perform songs off Cushion and Orange Juice being like, oh, this is dope. This is dope. And it's like now we look back like, oh, what a classic. But it's like <laughs> at the time, you know, I'm just like, these songs are better than the last couple songs he's been performing, you know? I'm like, these are dope. And then it's like, he just blows up and so it's real cool dang what about uh, how do you feel about the drill music and stuff that's happening right now because it's a different world now baby it's a different that, what world you did, yeah it was cool to trap and yeah you i, I robbed in my white tea it sounded <laughs> real cool to me but now niggas is drilling with i'll do this and they mm -hmm. jumping at the screen with the with whatever and it's tough because you got people like the uh the da in atlanta fanny Oh, she she's using the rap lyrics in oh, it. Yeah. They ain't trying to hear. They use it. She's like, give me you more. Say, but can and will. Do you advise anybody? You. Like when you hear people come into the booth and they're saying some things and you're looking like they gonna use it again. So you already know. Like, do you advise them? Like, man, you sure you want to put that in there? I always try to tell people to think about it twice. <laughs> I always do. There was songs we didn't put on Chicken Talk because he was talking about people. And oh he yeah. And he just because he was actually freestyle and he didn't know he was gonna talk about these people, mm -hmm. so he came out. He's like, man, I didn't even know I was gonna say that. I'm like, right. Never releasing it. Never. I'm just, but I'm, I'm knowing I'm not gonna release it. Like, <laughs> we're not even gonna debate about it, you know. But a lot of people, yeah, it's like. uh yeah, it's tough. It's like you don't uh, you don't want to give them evidence for your right. for your stuff, you know. And some people be like, I don't care, put it out. Yeah, and it's like you know, a lot of people are like, um, you know, it's just art. But if they can tie it back to a specific yeah. crime, you know, it's it's tough. But it's just yeah. like when social media first got out, people always would say, you know, the Fed's watching social media, right? I mean, before all this Rico stuff and any of that, right? When fir first when it came out, it's like if you're even going to go apply for a job. What you think a lot of these bosses do? They, they look at your resume, but they look for your social media, look for your Facebook right. page. Because I know people who did not get hired just because of things that they do on Facebook or on Instagram. They didn't give them their handle, but they went and found it. Mm. So I always tell people, be careful of what you put on social media because it's not only affecting you. It affects, you know, I mean, your job. People lose their job over stuff that they put on social media all the time. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You got to be careful out here. You have mm. to be careful. I, I just think that you know, music is something that it helps a lot of people, bro. Like, it, whether we want to admit it, and I hurt a lot of people, but it, it helps, helps a lot, lot of people. It's therapy. It's very much therapeutic, and it can be negative or positive. True. And so, where do you want to land in it? You know what I mean? Nowadays, man, I'm trying to get back to R&B, but y'all won't let me. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I'm an R&B guy, you know. Because R&B didn't so. hurt nobody. Yeah, but it did. Who did? Who did, yeah, it did. How did R and B hurt somebody? Man, you put in some of that uh, uh, Rick James go snort <laughs> cocaine all night. You know what I'm saying? This is what yeah. people were doing during the time. I don't call him R and B. What you call him then? That's the something. Funk. Wrong. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's the exactly. thing that the thing that almost bothers me more than people that are really in it is the people um, who aren't really of that, but making music in that lane. 
You know what I'm saying? That, that even bothers me more. It, like, I have, a class, I have a class at the University of Illinois called Music Monetization really? 499. Yeah, and one of the kids from the class, a couple of the kids, kind of like, we we're doing this music review. I was like, let me help get the kids. We did a boot camp over the summer. Mm-hmm. I was like, let me get the kids music ready to release. And a couple of them had like slide records. Mm. And they're in college in Illinois, you know, stuff goes down everywhere. But one of my, my co-hosts asked him, he was like, uh, what why, you are, you, that, why right? are you doing slide music? He was like, or he asked him, when was the last time you slid on an op? Right. And you know what he said? He was like, uh, last, last November, he was like, I had an issue with my roommate. I'm like, time out, dog. You know, and there's nothing about the kid. He'll probably watch it. I'm not talking about you. You know what I'm saying? But it's how ridiculous that is, right? Like right. to y'all. But to them, to him, that wasn't ridiculous for him to make. that's the way it is. No, slide he on the well, I, I had an issue with my roommate. I'm just, I slid on my op and I did it. You know, because it's like. It sounds cool. It that's sounds it cool. Is. And he literally, when he asked him why he made that song, he genuinely couldn't even come up with the reason of why. Mm-hmm. I could tell him just searching for like a why. And then somebody else did the same thing. And I'm like, I wouldn't be making this crazy kind of music. Because mm-hmm. I think, I don't think people understand the energy that comes back on you mm-hmm. when you put that energy out there. But now you kind of made yourself a target in a way. But no, you're right. To but where if you're like Jack Harlow, not rapping about any of that stuff, <laughs> you know, it's like Jack's not That's really true. a target specifically because he's not, ra- you know, Mm-mm. he's not rapping about I'm the hardest. I'm going to rob. I'm not doing none of that. Mm-mm. He's rapping about being first class. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And yeah. it's like some, I've heard a lot of um, old school rappers talk about how some of these new rappers are getting indicted and stuff exactly. like that. And they'll say this specifically didn't rap about the stuff they were doing, you know, almost as a way of like escaping or, or specifically, you know what I'm saying? It's like, they didn't want to do that. Mm-hmm. Let me tell you, you know? so. But I see, sorry, hold on a second. Ahead. But I see some of these young rappers who came from great households, never been in that situation or anything like that, purposely go out to be in certain situations so they have something to rap, rap about, about. Mm. so that they can be authentic because they don't want to rap about something that they're not involved in. I'm like, why are you going to go out here to look for trouble just to produce content? Right. And it's like, I didn't, uh, I didn't really notice it until I watched the Kanye documentary the other day. I watched the first half of it. And he really did almost kind of make it way cooler to just not rap about being the hardest. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize how it's like as much as things changed, they kind of came back a little bit. You know what I'm saying? It's like the hardships Mm -hmm. kind of back in vogue. But it's like when he came out, that's all it was. I'm the biggest, hardest, whatever. And then he came out and was like, I can rap about fashion or I can rap about other stuff. I could, you know, he almost made it cool to just rap about your feelings. And, you know, and so that was I thought that was dope, you know. And now it's kind of like came back around, but I don't let people know you can still just rap about whatever, you know? You don't have to rap about what you feel like people have been doing that's successful. I think that's what a lot of people who are green get into. They want to make music, beats, songs, like what's working so they can get into it as opposed to expressing themselves. My uh, biggest deal is, uh, you know, my guy, when they first came, this uh, this what they they would say, uh, my, my pinky ring be trill you cut and my eyes <laughs> you know I'm talking oh, about Birdman right. oh, yeah. when they came it wasn't they was just talking about what they had mm-hmm. the money and all that they didn't even talk about the, the, none of the other stuff really think about Some it other watch I got Liberace oh on it. man they loving you it can't they afford was, it but I can afford it yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, about, about, a year, about the year 2000 I'm a good eye my bus <laughs> you know what I'm oh, yeah. like they wasn't really talking about Oh, I'm going over and do this and do that as far as on the hustle like that, really. They were more talking about what they had accomplished already. Kind of like that a little better, to be honest with you. But it's always about materialistics. It's either about what you have. It's about either that, sex, guns. It's like, who raps about positivity? Unless they call it conscious rapping. Why well, that's the problem. Is like it immediately gets thrown into something into else. It's a like, different category, right? Like I engineer for David Banner, and it's like he's like they're they're labeling me a, a conscious rapper now. He's like I've been rapping about this shit, right? You know, it's like he's been on the same shit, but it's like now because he did it on a certain style of beat on the last album, mm-hmm. it's like now it's this, you know. Mm-mm-mm-mm. So how did you get um, involved with David Banner to work with him? So from mixtapes, this was mm. back from back in the day. He used to get on my tapes when I was like 17, 18 and do really? like a freestyle. He would just call me and be like, I'm going to patchwork. You know, I got to bring some beats. I'll do a freestyle for you. So I wasn't even producing. So I bring like Kanye's diamonds or any of this stuff. And people, he would always tell me like people always talk about the stuff we do. Mm-hmm. And um, I think I'd even uh, he'd hit me one day when I didn't even know about publishing and asked me to get young jock on his uh was it Get Like Me mm-hmm. that blew up? So I'd actually, because Jock had was my tape, he's like, you can get Jock to do this part so I don't have to pay for that part of the publishing. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, so he came and did it. So that was real dope. But actually, um, you know, I mixed a lot of his new album, um, mixed dope. his new single, Swing, and that's out. And mm-hmm. so maybe like three years ago, we linked back up and he had me like mixing his beats and kind of like helping him back up his files and stuff. And that, 
evolved into me recording this new album, The God Box mm. Two, and and working with more of that, and actually mixing the first single, Swinging, and awesome. some more of the stuff. And so that's been really cool. Like my talent has leveled up so much just from mm. working with him because mm. he doesn't accept less. I was you know? about to say, how is it? How because you've been working with him for a long time. You said from since you were, you know, he was seventeen, and you can see the growth. You can see, um, was he always that person who's always took his craft seriously, who's always like studying about how to improve and all of that? Absolutely, absolutely. He's always been on it, like such to a fine detail, mm -hmm. like very uh, specific about everything. And so it's been dope to actually work on the album and like help shape the album into something that he loves, you know, because I never thought I'd be able to hit his bar as far as like mixing a song or anything like that. And uh, the album sounds great. You know, the album's fire, it, it really is. When is it uh, releasing? releasing? I don't know when the date of the album is. Like I said, Swing and the single's out right now. I'm not sure. Um, and Bun B's actually on that. He did a little part Bun of the interview of for course. us. So it was definitely able to boy. make some Bun B vocals right there. That was yeah, really dope. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that, you, you, I can only imagine. I think it's a song we said. I can only, can only imagine. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine, you know, you and Bun B, you know, he's, Professor, you weren't Dr. Coach. I, <laughs> you know, I'm not going right. to be able to sit in the room with you two guys. You know, he's Man. professor. You, know, you just talked about being at the school. You know, y'all turning hip hop into something of educational. Which is good. Uh, yeah, hey, it makes it, it look different, doesn't it? Facts. We didn't see this coming back in the I day when it, it first jumped off. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? You just seen, you know, Cool Hurt. Uh, uh, you just seen one of these one of these boys up in New York. They was more of just. They didn't think rap was gonna last long. To be honest with you, when you seen uh, uh, them hip to the Hobbit boys, mm -hmm. uh, man, hip the ones I, I introduced I you to in Vegas. Mm -hmm. One of them passed away too. Mm -hmm. The ones who first to I can't remember, I can't remember the name. That's sad. You don't know who that is. You gotta remember these guys. Hobbit. Uh, yeah. To my Sugar Hill Gang? Yeah, Sugar oh, Hill yeah. Gang. Mm -hmm. When I'm, I introduced her to them, but real talk, like they didn't see this thing coming like you just spoke it. Right. Nobody did. You can't make this up. It's a lifestyle. It's culture. It's not going anywhere. It's best that we clean it up in a way to where we pretty it up and fancy it up so our kids can be educated in the process. Because if not, then it continues to be something where people just freelance and they didn't do whatever they want to do with it. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, the way I see it is so many people want to do it. I mm -hmm. want to help show people the right way. That's why I'm doing uh, exactly. options, my master class, which is where the class at um, University of Illinois came from. And I'm actually working with Kennesaw State right now, too. But basically, it's 15 videos and I teach you from the beginning how to produce, like what a good sample is, different production techniques, all the way down to mixing, networking, how to handle wow. your business. Just kind of like A to B, like A to Z on everything that you would need to know, like getting in the industry. And uh, you know, it's funny as a lot of people who are actually been in the industry a while are like, I didn't know this, or I didn't mm -hmm, know that, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I'm thinking this is like a beginner level thing. And it's like, no, actually I didn't know this part about publishing. Wow. I didn't know. Cause I think a lot of people don't know what their rights are until they get taken from you or you sign them away. Mm -hmm. You know, like I was um, fortunate enough to sign Pierre Bourne. Okay. He's like wow. one of the hottest producers of the past five years. Mm -hmm. Probably the, the most influential right now. Um, and I signed him straight out of SAE. I just wow. found him at a school. Um, but people don't know things. You know what I'm saying? Not necessarily just him, but just a lot of people. When you're so green, you want to be successful that you'll just sign anything and you'll do anything. And then because you're not willing to look for the knowledge because um, wouldn't all of this information, as much as you teach it, people always say there's nothing you can't learn off of YouTube. So wouldn't this information, you could still find it on YouTube if you were looking for it? The, the issue is discernment. I don't think people can discern the information. It's almost like information overload. Do I listen to this influencer or do I listen to this influencer? Correct. Mm -hmm. One could be right or one could be wrong or one could be 45% right and one could be, you mm -hmm. know, and it's like to me always, I'm trying to teach people to cherry pick the information that they, right. that they need for them. The one thing about YouTube, you got to know the question to ask. That's what you're kind of saying too. Mm. If you don't know how to, you don't know what to ask. You, you ask what you think you need. Am I right? Right, like, and I mean, if I'm trying to build something, I'm going to be like, let me build this, but I'm like, I got to put this in here right to get the right. The correct answer. And some, <laughs> of the, right, and some of the stuff is like the answer is different for everybody. That's exactly. why I realized too why the, the, the videos are so wide ranging because some people, because I do a consultant too, and some people like I listen to their beats and I'm like, they're not bad, they're just boring. Mm -hmm. How do you tell somebody that if they don't know that, that hasn't been around people that know this is just kind of boring? You know, and I show them how to sample, and then next week they're sending me beats and they're fire. Dope, dope. You know, man. to me, I love That's that. Dope. You know, like yeah. students at the University dope. of Illinois, I showed them, we did a, um, an interview and it made like the headline of their paper. But I showed them in that while they had the guy there how to create a sample, like 
everybody playing in the room is a piano. How many people could fit on it? Three people. All right, three people playing piano. You know, we got two amps, two people playing guitar, and just record it in the middle with one mic, sample that, loop it, make a beat out of it. You know, mangle it. Anyways, and so I was showing the kids, and like the next week, the kids like, all right, I did it, but I don't know where to take it. And I was like, this right here. Then the next week, he sends it back, and it sounds amazing. Mm. Wow, it sounds amazing. So how many like, kids do you have in the class? that want to know how to do all of that? So there's like three different hip hop courses at mm -hmm. um, the University of Illinois. Um, and so I think our class has like 25. So there's a lot of people interested in doing it. Yeah, absolutely. But the problem that we're running up to is a lot of people can't prove to their parents that they can make money off exactly. of music. It seems like such a pipe dream. And so that's why the class is Music Monetization 499. Do we're trying to show these kids oh. who play like jazz piano. Mm -hmm. There's 14 different ways you can make money. You can play at a bar. You can play on the side of the street. You can teach piano lessons. You can make but a little But what parents want to see their child you playing on the side of the street for money? Right. Well, I'm telling you, there's all these types of different ways to make money. Right. Make some money and show your parents you're making money off of it. You know, because a lot of them are like engineering major, mm -hmm. minor in music, or can't even do a minor in music. And they're just taking the class just because they want to do it. And they're like, right. man, I really don't want to do any of this engineering. But I can't prove to my parents I can make money Wait, off of it. How many of them are females? Um, Not enough. <laughs> not enough feeling. not I enough i mean that's part of what i'm doing there is helping diversify the mm -hmm. um, diversify well, what they have going on do you think they should start in uh in high school because a lot of stuff in high school we know it ain't gonna make you no money we're working Might on well coming just up. put it in high school i'm working <laughs> on coming out with more courses that are more hyper specific so like even just on bass just on um music supervision for movies and sync placements and stuff um and then coming out with k-12 through textbooks so that's i am cool. working on coming into that lane kind of found myself randomly in the college uh, area, mm -hmm. and then I guess I'm working my way back through it. Because some high schools, like I know the one in the Soda Duncanville, they do that because um, Ziggy made it, which is um, Lodizzi, which is Lodizzi is Yellow Beezy manager. Oh, where? His son is a producer, but he's also, he just graduated and gone to college, but in high school, they have a course that taught them how to do the mixing and all of that, to have all the equipment and everything, but not all high schools have that. That's dope. But that was, I thought that was amazing that they did that because there's so many young kids who end up leaving school and out on the street doing stuff and they love music. If they had those courses in school, they would probably be more involved in things like that rather than being on the street. 1,000%, you know, kids have to have access to things like this. To, that they would uh, be interested in. Absolutely. And it's like, if they don't know it's there, how could they possibly partake in it? Right. Uh, and, you know, it, that's why the good thing is about just being able to have a laptop now to be able to make music. Mm -hmm. It's just way more accessible. But now we need the arts back in the school. You know, it's like, when you talked about monetization and you're talking about these children in in college who have to prove to their parents, when you, because that's one question I was going to ask you, when you did all of that and you were sneaking around selling your DVDs and tapes and stuff like that, but your parents didn't know that's what you were doing, when, how old were you when you actually went to them and said, this is what I want to do full time? And uh, did they agree with you? Did they, were they that parent that said, you can't make no money from that? No, you need to go find a real job. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I think I had, uh, I went into college and I did a full year and I got an A average. I never had an A average in school ever before, but it was just cause it was tests. I guess I was good at tests and not busy work. And then I came back, I was like two weeks into the next semester and I was sitting in history class and I was like, I don't want to be a history teacher. Just had like this epiphany <laughs> and I just got up and I walked out. No. And I called my mom like on the way to the car. I know like a movie, so dramatic. <laughs> mom, I'm not going to college. You know, I was going to be the first one to graduate college and all that stuff. Oh, wow. And I just said, I'm already doing this music. It's not going to help with the music. I'd already tried to get in the music program uh, and they wouldn't let me because I didn't play an instrument. Mm. Now I play plenty of instruments, you know? <laughs> um, and so that's what we're trying to fix up at like University of Illinois so and some of these other places. So back then you had to play an instrument to be in the music. And most major colleges for the music, to get in the music programs, you have to play an instrument. Which think about how many people that cuts off who want to play an instrument right. or, so we're trying to fix that at some colleges right now. Um, but yeah, they weren't seeing the vision at all. And for sure they thought I just sold drugs right for managed. a while. Yeah. You know? <laughs> like just dealing in cash. Yeah, you're hanging just with the right people. Cash, you know what I'm saying? Right hanging people. out all night, you know, coming right. in at all hours, smelling like straight weed. <laughs> you know, it's like, this, yeah. this, this kid, our son is selling drugs. He has to be, you know? And I'm like, no, I'm hanging out with rappers. And then the only reason I think my dad started believing me because he would hear about some of these rappers like, oh, Pastor Troy or, oh, right. this person or Gucci Mane or T.I. He would hear those names and be like, Okay, well, you know, he's doing that, but they still didn't believe until I do stuff like um, go to the Museum of Modern Arts and perform or 
I'm in the New York Times, and then they'll see it like, all right, all right. You know, it's like, <laughs> how do they feel now? Do they ever bring those conversations back up? Uh, I remember when you was young? They're proud now. They, they, they didn't. Uh, they just didn't see the vision. You know, like yeah. I took my mom to the uh, recording academy event the other day for the summer thing, and everybody kept Aww. thinking she was like a part of the academy. She's like, everybody thinks I work for the academy. She was so, <laughs> <laughs> she was so crawl, you know. But to watch her just out there dancing with my aunt and everything, cool. it was real nice. That's dope, That's man. Just uh, who would you who would you like to work with? Uh, Andre three thousand. Damn. Come on, man. Everybody. Come on, That's man. That's why he retired, didn't he? I think no, he did. No, but he's, he'll get on the phone every now and then. I, I feel like he's just going to drop sporadic music. Yeah. You know? I and think so, he don't want to put no rules to it. Yeah, and he doesn't want any expectations on it. There I can you imagine. go. So I would like to just, on the very lowest of keys, I want to tell nobody, Andre. Let's just get in the studio. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't going to tell nobody. Let's just man. get in the studio, you know? Top three producers of all time? Yeah. Oh, top three, top three. All uh, right. Gotta go organize noise. Okay. okay. That's no Gotta one. go pimp C. Hey, Ooh. boy, that's my guy. You can come back in. Come on. <laughs> that boy watched the show right there. Yeah. Come on, man. Have and, you ever met him? And uh, no, I, I was not able to meet Pimp C. No, yeah, I, I seen wish him I was. Once. I didn't get to talk to him. Went yeah. To the show. Man, and, and my second one, I wanna. No, number third. three. You said, third, you said oh, third, oh, yeah, the third one. Is is really almost a tie between DJ Paul and Juicy J and T Mix. No, you only can pick one. It's hard. It's hard. No, you can only pick one. DJ Paul and Juicy J. DJ Paul and Juicy J. It's hard. They're such the blueprint for a lot of what what I grew up on and what's going on right now. It's hard for everybody who makes beats not to say DJ Paul and Juicy J are probably one of their biggest influences. You know, but T Mix is coming right behind that. Bro, Swap House, all that stuff. Come on, bro. You you a UGK fan, bro? That Love nigga it. fanning out. I'm listening to everything he's saying over there, Love putting it. him in that box. Okay, hey, so man. top three <laughs> artists of all time. Any genre, though. Top three artists. Any Outcast. genre. Outcast got to be number, number one. one. Outcast is number one. Atlanta, bro. Man. It's like, as much as I say I want to work with Andre, if I could get Big Outcast boy. in the studio, bro, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? It's like, I think Andre kind of became the unicorn just because he stepped out of the game, and now everybody's like, <laughs> Andre, you know what I'm saying? It yeah. kind of made it look different, but really it's Outcast together because you yeah. can think about it, ain't nothing but a chicken wing and all that. Hey. That was Dre. Yeah. I mean, that, I mean, that was big. big that was big, big you know what I'm saying? It's like he brought that flair yeah. to it, you know? Yeah. Um, so I would say Outcast, um, man, as far as, uh, are we talking about my favorites? Yes. You're just talking about. Artists of all time, any genre. Uh, people that impacted your life. Oh, of any genre. Any genre. That's oh, what I said. Now saying. you just opened it all the way. Right. Up. Any genre. Uh, I'd have to put Pink Floyd in there. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Pink Floyd. That's dark, number two. Floyd. The Dark Side of the Moon is why my music's so spacey and it. Like mm-hmm. I always, people say your beat sounds so cinematic. I'm like, well, I've heard the Dark Side of the Moon. I know what it possibly <laughs> could be. You that's know? it. That's it. Um, between that and Outcast, that's like all the spacey sounds, ATL in and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah. Yeah. Number um, three. And number three, you know, I'd probably have to say Ti is probably like my second favorite rapper just just for the era that i grew up in and everything like that like well, you, andre you first uh well no 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 i was I already put outcast first who, who yeah. your first your your favorite rapper is, is outcast outcast absolutely My and ti Out, is like give me because the way i feel like is just give me their discography and and that's all i can listen to you know like, that, absolutely outcast and to discography, you know. That damn T.I., boy, that nigga can rap. That's a rapping yeah, fool. He really can. And I love the early stuff so much. Oh, man. You know, like all Don't the way through Urban Legend. Be honest. Yeah, all the way through Urban Legend and all no that. More. I really do. He won't even do it. He do it. He do his own thing. He do it. He, him and Lil Wayne, them, these guys done changed their style him. up so much. I be wanting to go back just a little bit. And I know they, they've evolved. But I'm like, damn, I loved it, that era. That was a del- hell of an era. And that's specifically why I like this Banner album so much. Okay. Because it feels like he's giving you the album that he wants to give you and that you want from him he at the same time. Same time. You know, because sometimes I feel like people, they'll be onto something new. Because I think as artists, we'll kind of get in our head about stuff sometimes. We look at it so long. It's like when you look at a word for so long and you're like, feel, 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 <laughs> fell, fell. That's not even a word. You know, it's like you look at the thing for too long. And I think as an that artist, change, that's, right. we're living with the song for months before it comes out. We're living mm-hmm. with this stuff. So I think it's easy to get in our head about stuff and like kind of get away from what, not necessarily just people want from us, but what we're good at almost, you know? Man, David Banner is, like I said, uh, he one of those guys, man, you you blessed that you've worked with all the, you've worked with a bunch of good, great artists, man, great culture-driven people who, you, you, you're you a part of this whole thing, like I keep saying, so just dope, man. Thank you so much for coming on the show. We love you. Hey, appreciate for it, sure. man. Give me the big pound. Much love, y'all. Hey, I watch I Boss Talk the, all the time. He love oh, Boss awesome. Talk. You know yeah, what I'm saying? Most people do. We, we, we knew, but we here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
Absolutely. Man, so how can people get a hold of you before I can get you out of here? Uh, all social media, media at DJ B U R N O N E, DJ Burn One, and then www.the5pointsbakery.com. You can get my masterclass options. The pre order is up right now. Um, and yeah, check us out. We got a lot of music coming out. Got Box 2 coming out. I've been working on my album. I ain't talk about it a lot because I'm in the process, not trying to change anything. But it, I got a lot of a lot of dope stuff on there. Your I got a lot album? of legends. Yeah, I'm working on my album right now. Kind of like a compilation album. Okay, that's so I got a dope. bunch of different um, like legends and new school folks on the album. You want to name out some names of who you have on there? Damn, uh, not yet because I want to make sure <laughs> everything's finished. Down, right? You know, yeah. clearances and everything. I'm like, okay. Don't want to jinx anything. We'll do another interview once, okay. I, once go. I get it done. We're, we're going to bring back the Dallas. We're going to bring yeah. the Dallas. That'll be heartbreaking. You, you know, I used to come to Dallas every, because my Mexican side of my family's out there. My mom's Mexican. So I used to come out there every Can summer. So I spent all halfway. Enough to get myself, <laughs> enough, in, trouble. Enough to get myself in trouble and be like, oh, damn it. <laughs> you know, I'll get it going. And I'm like, oh. Well, you would come to finish. Dallas for us? You yeah. Will? Oh, I'd love to come to Dallas. That'd man, be awesome. thank you so much, yeah. man. Daniel, shout out to Daniel Payne. That's my boy. Hey, man, thank you for coming on the show. It's been another great segment of Boss Talk 101 where the bosses talk. And hey. we have.